Good afternoon, I'm Kim Baird and I'll be chairing today's meeting. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I have a consulting business and I've worked on energy related issues as well as other First Nation related files, primarily in the province of BC. I was the elected chief of Tuasson First Nation for 13 years. So my particular area of interest and expertise is that of Aboriginal rights and title and First Nation consultation issues. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt who jointly welcomed us here yesterday, thankfully. And a few moments about why this panel is here in the background of our panel. In advance of a broader review of the federal environmental assessment processes, the Minister of Natural Resources, Jim Carr, set up this panel to hear from community stakeholders and Indigenous groups about issues people feel were not adequately addressed by the National Energy Board hearings for this proposed project. So far we've met with municipal government, stakeholder groups, Indigenous peoples, interveners, and those that were denied the opportunity to intervene, and other members of the public along the proposed route in both Alberta and BC. In all, we will hold 44 meetings over 18 days. To date, we've had over 1,600 attendees, I haven't really uh, tallied up this week yet, and over 500 of whom have presented to this panel. And online, more than 16,000 questionnaires have been submitted and 300 emails have been received. Groups and individuals have shared thoughtful presentations reflecting a diversity of important perspectives. Our role as a panel is not decision making nor is it to make recommendations, but our role is to listen to you and to all others who've come before us to share their views about the proposed Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project and to share what we learn in a report to the minister. We have professional recorders on site capturing comments and we also appreciate copies of your written submissions should you have them, uh, especially if they refer to any uh, studies or links you would like us to look at. During the months of September and October, we will prepare a report on what we've heard, in particular, what our mandate is to focus on what was not considered during the NEB process. And we will provide that report to Minister Carr on November 1st. Our report will help inform the government's decision on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion proposal expected in December. In making its decision on whether the proposals in the national public interest, the government will consider four reports. The National Energy Board report, Crown consultation with Indigenous groups, an evaluation of upstream greenhouse gas emissions, and the report from this panel. Um, I'd like to allow Annette to introduce herself. Hello, my name is Annette Trimby. I'm the President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Winnipeg. My academic background is in aquatic ecology and before I moved back home to Winnipeg, I was a Deputy Minister in the Alberta Public Service. So uh, this afternoon's first session is uh, Roundtable with Environmental NGOs and uh, I'm just going to say right up front that I appreciate all the work environmental NGOs have done to inform the public about this panel. We know there has been some process challenges and issues and so you know, uh, as chair of the panel, I would like to thank uh, everyone's contribution to trying to make this work, even though I know there's disagreement about this process, our terms of reference and, and that kind of thing. We really are happy to have had a lot of participants and we do have to, you know, give credit where credit's due for that assistance. So thank you to the environmental NGOs for that. Hi, good morning. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge that we're here today on Lekwungen territory, home of the Songhees and Esquimalt Nation. I'm Caitlin Vernon, campaign director with Sierra Club BC. Uh, we're, as an organization, we've been around almost 50 years. We work to defend BC's wild places and species within the urgent context of climate change. Uh, and my colleague, our energy and climate campaigner, Larissa Stendi, is actually going to speak first. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, my name is Larissa Stendi. I'm the climate and energy campaigner for Sierra Club BC. Um, I'm going to go through a number of um, pieces, but um, primarily looking at oil spill realities, as well as participation in the public interest this afternoon. 
We and others had asked the government when forming this panel to stop at other tanker route communities, but as that didn't happen, I do feel it necessary to reiterate the scientifically proven impossibility of marine bituin spill response and the dangers posed by tanker traffic to the island's ecology and economy, as well as potentially irreparable harm to our coastal oriented culture. Last December, the National Academy of Sciences produced a report for the US Congress that bitumen sinks in water. Uh, I, this is a copy of the cover of that, but I can provide that to you if you're interested. This is unassailable silent, science that the NEB refused to consider. To not include the most up-to-date and serious science is nonsensical and demonstrates a lack of commitment to truly protecting the public interest. I applaud the provincial and federal government's efforts to make much needed improvement measures for response to the more than 1,200 transits already plying our waters. But in no way can anything justify a 700% increase in bitumen laden tankers. That is 400 more tankers. To be crystal clear, a world class spill response regime is not effective. No technology exists that is capable of cleaning up diluted bitumen. Once the potentially fatal benzene has off gassed, it sinks, coating everything in tar. World class is a hollow measure when the best recovery rates for floating conventional crude oil is 15%. Currently, our government's response capacity is regulated for about 10,000 tons. This is a quarter of the amount of oil spilled from the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil tanker disaster. It's seven to eight times lower than the capacity of the Afromax tankers that currently transit the Strait of Georgia and the Salish Sea. Afromax have the capacity of 120 thousand metric tons of crude oil. Modeling and reports done by oil spill experts, NUCA, describe the near impossibility of even getting to a spill along the KM tanker route 57 to 78 percent of the time. It, the Salish Sea has uh, rough weather, high seas, and this creates an impossibility of even using recovery methods like skimmers and booms, which mean we would also be reliant on uh, chemical dispersants. Only that these toxins have actually been proven ineffective for bitumen recovery, and the research is out as to the full impacts on sea life. It doesn't even matter how prepared we are, as nothing is adequate to cover spilt bitumen, and spills are inevitable, as 80% of oil spills are the result of human error. Beyond the science, real world examples demonstrate this tragedy enough. No doubt by now you've heard all about oil spills in English Bay, in the Kalamazoo River, in the Gulf of Mexico, and almost 30 years later, still Exxon Valdez's impacts, uh, oil persists in these environments long after cleanup crews have left. Kinder Morgan has described how, quote, pipeline spills have both can have both positive and negative effects on local and regional economies, both in the short and long term. Like many, I find this statement telling and deeply offensive. Dangerous jobs and spill response should never be touted as a replacement for sustainable coastal jobs. Saying so demonstrates a profound misunderstanding of the depth of relationships con connecting these livelihoods and places, piling on insult to grievous loss that I shouldn't even have to explain. Our allies at Living Ocean Society and the Georgia Strait Alliance have done a great deal of work on marine oil spill response and highlight that the business closures, decline in tourism and property values, and the attendant strain on social fabric are hugely problematic. Vancouver's mayor described recently to you that there is very significant spill risk, risk to the regional economy and could cost up to 687 million in GDP to clean up. And as First Nations described yesterday and all along the path of these uh, meetings and these pipelines proposals, they are compelled yet again to explain how a spill would create an existential crisis for their way of life dependent as they are as the table being set by marine and natural bounty of their territories. And so many have denied their consent. I ask you, what is a culture worth? Tanker traffic increases threats to marine life habitats, uh, most notably our fragile populations of southern resident orcas and recovering humpback whales. Our oceans are in trouble. It's not just acidification killing shellfish or resident killer whales or pollution or failing salmon runs. The abundance is lost and dwindling. We must be doing everything in our power to protect what we can and not make matters worse. I ask you, what is an ecosystem worth? 
I'm also here today to talk about consultation, public interest, and democracy. Respected panel, you have been tasked with an unenviable job, trying in too short a time to undo the societal and cultural damage and cynicism instilled by the erosion of democratic impulse experienced by many of those who tried to participate in NEB panels and hearings. I have researched extensively the struggles between extractive industries and communities in developing contexts around the world. But when I heard about the possibility of Enbridge being built, I couldn't believe what was happening at my, ho in, at my home country, in both in the tar sands and across the West. Abandoning months of fieldwork in the Amazon, I ended up writing my master's thesis on whether international standards of consultation were present in the NEB's joint review panel for the Northern Gateway. I studied free prior informed consent, which is fundamental to our commitment to implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I also applied general principles of deliberative and participatory democracy and found that that process was woefully inadequate, conforming to neither set of principles for meaningful consultation. And recently, the highest courts of the land have agreed with me. And many experts have also since agreed that, in fact, that deeply flawed process was far more robust and recognizable than the NEB's more recent review of Kinder Morgan which occurred after the previous government's changes via fundamentally undemocratic omnibus bills. It's true, you have recently borne the brunt of people's frustrations, accumulated over years of preparations of trying to engage in good faith in a process that locked out many voices seemed rigged and seemed rigged from the onset. Working with many of the interveners and commentators, or commenters, sorry, we wrote a report that details many, many of the ways that the NEB was deeply unfair, called Credibility Crisis. And I brought some copies for you today, if you'd like to have a look. Yes, <laughs> Yesterday, one of you asked what good consultation would look like. And we have excellent examples in this country. The Berger Commission on the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline in the 70s was a great example. It went to potentially affected communities and really heard their concerns and then acted appropriately to respond to those concerns. I'm not alone in believing that the NEB forgot who they work for, that they are public servants and their main concern is the public interest, not big oil, not foreign interests, but the people in these rooms. I understand that your role is to report back to Prime Minister Trudeau and the Cabinet about what you've heard and that a report will be written to help them decide in December about this pipeline. The government that appointed you was elected because they promised to do better, that real and meaningful consultation with impacted First Nations and communities matters. But that trust is not being recovered by your panel missing its third member. His absence is an insult to the people of Vancouver Island who are here today. As de facto chair, your impartiality has also been broken, Ms. Baird, by choosing to write an op-ed last weekend whilst in the midst of these proceedings. In it, your bias seems so deeply ingrained, I'm not even sure you intended the dismissive tone taken throughout towards the people you are supposed to be listening to. Our very grounded concerns with process flaws, faulty science, and inherent bias described as complaints. In that op-ed, your top-line takeaway from all of this wasn't that no matter where you went, 90 to 100% of people in both forums were dead set against this proposal. That more than 144,000 signatures were delivered to you in Vancouver last week. That almost 600 people have spoken and 1,600 have attended these meetings. And that's before what we're hoping shows up this afternoon. And that, that also includes representatives from about 30 municipalities and 25 First Nations. No. Instead, you wrote as a top line takeaway that the 10% of vested interests in business supporting this pipeline were impatient to put shovels in the ground and to cash in on this short term gain. Should these powerful interests tip the balance of this exercise? I'm from Alberta and I understand that you cannot pull a red thread on anything without it leading back to the oil industry, which gives that industry incredible power over our policy and culture. And their oil to tidewater argument has been proven false a rationale to rip and strip as fast as possible these stranded assets. I have copies of an excellent briefing document also produced by a number of our allies that d further explains the falseness of the t Tidewater argument. So um, I look forward to bringing that to you. 
Was this consultation type activity to gauge public opposition or to restore some faith in federal governments being based in the will of the people? Or is this yet another Orwellian example of all being equal, but some being a bit more equal than others? The opposition to this project is not something that can be glossed over. You've heard from First Nations, you've heard from scientists, experts, economists. You've heard from people who are very afraid for the places and people that they love. They have tried to operate within this system, but they do not feel heard. And that makes people angry, strengthening their resolve. Sure, we've complained about the last process and this proposal, because that's what happens when people feel powerless and unheard. Another thing that happens when people feel powerless and unheard is they protest on a mountaintop to protect a park they love. When people feel powerless and unheard, they elect new governments. Please take that message to Prime Minister Trudeau and remind him why he was elected in BC. You have no choice but to report unequivocally how in every meeting in BC, 90 to 100% of people are against this project. We asked people to wear black this afternoon in the town hall as we wanted to be sure there was no room for confusion. Kinder Morgan is not welcome here. You have no choice but to report that the people of BC will never accept this or other destructive fossil fuel projects. That we are strong and united in the understanding that the risks are too great to our local cultures, vibrant economy, coastal ecology, and global climate. We hope you will remind them who they work for. And also ask whether it's worth alienating those hundreds of thousands of people across the province, country, and globe to pursue this outdated, polluting, extractive approach to economic development. Or, to see that these people in these rooms are providing a basis for Trudeau's mandate to be the leaders we voted for, moving boldly and decisively towards investing in the emerging green post-carbon economy. Dear panelists, it sits in your hands to explain the reality of this unwavering passion and united commitment people have for this coast and the fight that you would have on your hands to build this pipeline. As Caitlin and Lex addressed, the climate crisis requires united action like no challenge humanity has ever faced. And there isn't a moment or dollar to waste on moving us in the wrong direction. The nation building projects we need are not rooted in sacrificing our coastal or northern communities. Nation building means balancing competing interests for the greatest benefit for the, of the, for the greatest number. And that cannot be argued in this case when benefits accrue largely for foreign ownership of tar sands and pipelines while putting our collective future in jeopardy. We are not interested in locking into outdated, dirty technology, leaving us behind the rest of the world. But that said, we must find ways to support Alberta while they make the necessary transition to diversifying and strengthening their economy. We cannot pretend to take seriously any government action on climate while some simultaneously continuing to build fossil fuel projects that hasten our destruction. Your reason surely understands this. You have the chance to be the heroes of this story. We are relying on your integrity and candor to report all of what you've heard, to demonstrate an understanding of real reconciliation by allowing yourselves to be moved by deeply listening to the anguish of and concerns this proposal has brought your First Nations neighbours and your countrymen, and to waive the grave consequences of ignoring the people across this province who've been saying for a decade that they will not let this project happen. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. So you started out today by mentioning that you wanted to hear about the gaps and the failures of the National Energy Board process. So I'd like to just say a few words about climate change, which was a notable omission. Uh, who am I? I was born literally one block from here, and my trip home from the hospital was on a BC ferry. I grew up on both sides of the Salish Sea under the canopy of cedar trees, canoeing in Trincomalee Channel, poking around in tide pools, watching fishing boats unload in the Vancouver Harbour. I've worked across Canada and internationally, but this coast is my home. And this pipeline and tankers project, it really scares me. We know that the whales are endangered, that accidents happen, 
and spills are impossible to clean up. We know that pipelines are not job creators unless you want a toxic job in oil spill cleanup. And we know that the choice we make about this pipeline will impact the future of life on Earth as we know it. This is not fear-mongering. This is science. Climate change is game on. It's here. The only real question is, what are we going to do about it? Because it's getting real, real fast. Scientific predictions in BC are coming true even faster than expected. Droughts, wildfires in coastal rainforests, glaciers melting, western red cedar trees that will never again grow this big, river water so low that salmon have to be trucked upstream, river and ocean temperatures so high that this year is the worst sockeye salmon run in history, an ocean acidifying to the point that shellfish cannot form their shells. So often we hear climate impacts described like this in a long litany of disaster. But behind each impact is a story, a love for a place, and a whole lot of grief and fear. When we pay attention to what's happening in the world around us, when we really pay attention, it can be upsetting. It's a lot to take in. So when we consider proposals like this Kinder Morgan pipeline, not only do we need to ground our decisions in science, we need to acknowledge and make space for the collective sadness and fear. We need to talk about how global warming threatens so much that we know and love so dearly. Because to what degree and how quickly the ocean is acidifying is not just a question of science. This is a question of cultures, of clam gardens and reef net fisheries. It's a question of livelihoods, of food security, of coastal identity. But we don't have any forum to talk about it. The National Energy Board didn't allow us to talk about climate change, even though the tar sands production needed to fill this pipeline with bitumen would increase Canada's CO2 emissions by 7.7 .7 million tons per year. The emissions associated with pipeline operation would be 1.1 million tons of CO2 a year. And whatever oil doesn't spill from the pipeline or tankers will spill into the atmosphere intentionally when it reaches its destination and is burned. That's another 71.1 million tons of CO2 per year. Climate change has no borders. Wherever the bitumen gets burned, we are all downstream and we are all directly affected no matter what the NEB tried to tell us. Our new federal government was elected on commitments for real action on climate change. To stay beneath the 1.5 degrees warming, as we have committed to with the Paris Climate Agreements, means that globally our carbon budget, which is what we still have available to burn, is less than 550 gigatons. When you compare that to the 2,900 gigatons of known fossil fuels in the world, the math is very clear. To reduce global warming, we need to leave most of the known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. The bottom line is this. It is not possible to be a climate leader and build a tar sands pipeline. So it was a good move by the federal government when they announced a new methodology to assess the upstream greenhouse gas emissions of this pipeline. Unfortunately, what we have seen of the proposed methodology thus far is woefully insufficient. Let me be very clear. The upstream greenhouse gas assessment does not make up in any way for how the NEB did not address climate. First, because any robust climate test needs to consider not just the upstream, but also the downstream emissions. <laughs> a 
and fundamentally, the methodology is unclear about what possible future we're using as the baseline for making our decisions. It leaves open the possibility that we won't take action on climate change, that we won't implement the Paris climate agreements that we just signed. This is not the leadership that Canadians voted for. For a robust climate test, this pipeline needs to be assessed on the basis of one, climate science, for both upstream and downstream emissions. Two, whether the additional emissions associated with this pipeline fit within Canada's 2030 carbon budget. And three, global demand scenarios that are consistent with international climate commitments and a global economic transition away from fossil fuels. Because when you consider the reduced demand for oil, as globally we move to a post-carbon economy, not only is this project incompatible with Canada's climate goals, it doesn't make economic sense either. So here we are at a fork in the road. We face a stark choice. We could keep building infrastructure like this pipeline and lock ourselves into ongoing and severe global warming and our children and grandchildren might never know the taste of shellfish or wild salmon. Or we can choose a different path we can take the $3 billion per year that's handed out to the fossil fuel sector and we can invest that in clean energy instead, supporting more jobs along the way. I, for one, would like us to choose the future where we can still pull dinner from the ocean. These public meetings have provided the Prime Minister with an excellent opportunity to change policy direction. His government has the community backing, as evidenced by these meetings all along the route, has the community backing to drop its support for Kinder Morgan and bring Canada's economic policy into alignment with its commitments on climate. True sunny ways will require letting go of the fossil fuel haze. You know, all my life I've been crossing the Salish Sea. Last year, for the very first time, I saw a humpback whale from the ferry. They're coming back to these waters. Recently, I heard a story that a sea otter was spotted off the coast of Victoria. They too are making a slow comeback. These stories give me so much hope. To give ourselves and the animals around us a fighting chance, in the face of climate change, we need to stop making things worse. We have one shot at this. There can only be one future for this coast and for the climate that we all depend on. Let's work together to make it the best one possible. Thank you. Uh, Ted, Ted Wojhilowicz. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, panel. My name is Ted Vinelovich, and I'm here as a citizen and a supporter of the uh, Victoria chapter of the Council of Canadians. Uh, the Council is a non-profit, non-partisan uh, group with about 65 chapters across Canada. We focus on uh, many issues, among which some are uh, the issue of sovereignty, environment, and a vibrant and healthy democracy. An additional 400 tankers per year in Burrard Inlet is a concept that should remain in a state of permanent freeze. Clearly, the chances of oil spills aren't matters of if a spill will happen, but when it will happen. Cleanup, as one speaker mentioned yesterday, is defined when between 5 and 15% of the spill is retrieved from the surrounding waters. Needless to say, that's not good enough it's not a cleanup. A global television investigation recently reported that over a 37 year period, there were 60,119 oil spills in Alberta. According to data found on a Saskatchewan government website, the most recent North Saskatchewan River spill, 
that denied over 30, 70,000 residents of their right to safe and reliable drinking water was just one of 18,000 spills in that province since 1990. A 10 year snapshot from 2006 to present reveals over 8,360 spills in Saskatchewan alone, 17.5% from one particular company. Our recommendation is, as the banner says, no tankers, no pipelines, no problem. Thank you. I, uh, I threw up my speech too, I threw it out, uh, and I thought I would just speak from the heart. My message is that we can change, and my life has changed greatly because of climate change. Uh, Canadians are ready for change. We can do it. So I ask you, panel members, your bosses, your bureaucrats, your political leaders, I ask you to take a stand. This is too important for business as usual mentality. Uh, why are we here? Why are we discussing a pipeline? We should be discussing renewable energy. My name is Peter Nix, and, and I have evolved and changed from an oil sands consultant to a carbon buster. So, so if... <laughs> that's a self-appointed title, by the way, and, and, and totally unpaid. In my own life, I don't fly for pleasure. I don't, uh, I, I, I don't... I have an electric car, which I came down here on, so we can change. I have 192 solar panels in my backyard, which is my pension money, and I'm going to make 4% profit, which, it's, which, which is, I think, a better use of my money than, than investing it in the stock market. <laughs> Just one, one last sentence. If all the economic arguments and the technical arguments and the morality arguments fail to convince your political masters, then just think about this. In, in Saudi Arabia, they're producing electricity at five cents a kilowatt hour. That's equivalent to oil at $10 a barrel. The fossil fuel companies are going bankrupt. Coal has gone bankrupt, some of them, and the rest are going to follow. It doesn't make, it makes no sense to invest in fossil fuel energy. The Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So first off, I want to say my name is Hanquithia Erlen Thomas, better known as Erlen Thomas. I come from Snenemoch First Nation territory, and for those of you that don't know, that's in Nanaimo area. I want to make it clear to our TMX panel that on no uncertain terms that Snenemoch does not support the TMX pipeline. It threatens our way of life, it threatens our culture, and it threatens what is left for our generations that are unborn today. What's at the crux of this issue? And it's that almighty dollar. Culture, values, way of life versus the almighty dollar. I choose culture, value, happiness, and a way of life over the almighty dollar any day. And right now, I could tell you 100% there's zero support for that, but if we are to have this discussion first off, recognition and respect needs to be there. And this, this panel approach definitely does not show us the name of respect at all. Um, I don't see any ministers there. I understand it's a community engagement function, but respect requires the decision maker to be at the table. I'm one decision maker. <laughs> Um, Stenemok hasn't seen one sniff of a parliamentary representative come to our territory. And if it's a TMX panel that I'm dealing with, that, that's just completely ludicrous because I would want to be talking to the government themselves, not somebody they're holding out for communi uh, community engagement purposes. So again, we need to shift out of this consultative framework into a consent-based framework. I look forward to seeing where this goes. Hi, Tsepka. Good afternoon. I am fiercely opposed to Trans Mountain expansion. 
My name is Howard Breen. I'm the executive director of UCOR, the Urgent Climate and Action, Urgent Climate and Ocean Rapid Response. BC, under Stephen Harper and Christy Clark, has become a dirty energy hotspot. And here we thought we had broken free of Stephen Harper's oil addiction, only to be replaced by a prime minister who seemingly can't do emission math or recall that he pledged in Paris to hold the country to a 1.5 C friendly emission reduction. It is ethically and ecologically indefensible to pledge and then dismiss the 1.5 C survival threshold. The climate rebellion alarm bell has sounded and the world is watching. The government must urgently connect the dots between fossil fuel development and the 13 hottest consecutive months in recorded history as a direct result of our emitting more CO2 faster than any other time in 66 million years. Investments in oil pipelines in 2016 is like pulling the pin on a global hand grenade. Don't let Kinder Morgan's death wish become our death sentence. Climate and oceans matter. It's simple. If we don't preserve and protect them, we perish. Do we really expect a future wild salmon to survive in something akin to battery acid? Really? This NEB process is a subtle act of corruption. It corrupts the valuable time that is needed to save ourselves. The world, the world doesn't need pipelines, it needs lifeboats. Put the Koch brothers and the Trumps of the world in homeless camps and give climate refugees their homes. The El Nino spawned Fort Mac fire and those in California are a prelude to the crematorium of civilization. Nature does not negotiate, she only repossesses. Why is government transforming the most biodiversely rich province into the fastest extractive development region in the country? The haunted hellscapes of Mount Pauly and Site C come immediately to mind. Halt! Please go back and tell the government to wake up and end the nightmare, or we will surely be theirs. If they ignore our voices, we promise you resistance in the streets and on the pipeline route, more occupations of your offices. Should the government do the unthinkable and threaten land and ocean defenders with an iron fist, we say, bring it on. What do any of us and our families have to lose when we face losing a livable planet? There is no planetary emergency exit. We are Harper survivors. We will be Trudeau survivors. United together, we will be climate survivors, with you or without you. Canada is our Earth place, and the planet and its people matter. Thank you for conveying this message. My name is Sue Andrews, and I represent the Greenpeace um, Victoria local, local group. I also volunteer with the Sierra Club of BC, Wilderness Committee, Dogwood, the Green Party, and Bike to Work Week. And I'm also on the board of a small NGO that feeds 650 children in Tanzania breakfast every day. Some of you might think that this is overkill. I do not. And this flurry of activity comes directly from my desperation. To understand my desperation, I have to tell you a little bit more about myself. As you can hear, I don't come from Canada. I was not lucky enough to be born Canadian. I was born into apartheid South Africa. And for those of you who know, growing up in that brutal, inhumane culture, 
all right? It was something very hard to do. One of my earliest memories was standing on the corner in my hometown, which is also the hometown of Stephen Biko, and watching the tanks roll by and the policemen preventing people from walking around in our town. So it's not really surprising that when I heard about a prime minister called Trudeau, who thought that multiculturalism was the way to go, was the future, was it any wonder that I wanted to become Canadian? Was it any wonder that I wanted to be <clears throat> in a place where races of a different kind were valued and not just tolerated, were seen as an asset and not something to be repressed and oppressed? Some years later, I was sitting in the, looking at the bookshelf of the man I ended up marrying and who ended up being the father of my daughter. And I came across a pile of magazines. They were called Beautiful British Columbia. And I fell in love. And I determined again that I would come to this place and I would be Canadian. It took me 22 years. But I came and I've been here for the last 17. I'm married to a Canadian. My grandson is the product of a Sikh father and a South African mother. He is quintessentially a result of Pierre Trudeau's multiculturalism and I am immensely proud of him. And that desperation I told you about, that comes for him. Because I, as a grandmother and a mother, am desperate I'm desperate for our voices to be heard. Hold on one second, sorry. I have to confess, this is quite obvious, that I don't want to be here. I am way out of my comfort zone. After watching the videos of the other hearings in other places, I'm fairly, fair, fairly certain that the panel members are not in their comfort zone either. It must have been extremely difficult to hear and be the focus of so much anger and so much pain over the last few weeks. I really, truly hope that you will not see that as an attack on you personally, but a measure of the desperation that not just me, but all the other people in this room are feeling. You have probably become aware that all of us, pretty much, are very cynical about this process, how it has come into being, and how it is proceeding. And yet we are here. We are here because we are desperate to save our beautiful home from a project that is so ill-advised that it is laughable if it were not so tragic. I actually find it hard to believe that we are even discussing it, just like other people have expressed today. I have an alternative proposal. Why does not Kinder Morgan put up solar panels and wind turbines the length of the pipeline that exists today instead? And yes, you laugh. Is it any more ludicrous than what they currently propose? I bet you Kodak wishes that they'd gone digital a lot sooner than they did. Companies like Google, Apple, Starbucks, Philips, Nike, Nestle even, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, HP, H&M, Goldman Sachs, Coca-Cola, BMW, Bloomberg, Adobe, Ikea, and yes, even Walmart, right, have committed to a, going 100% renewable and are spending billions to do so. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. China, India, Brazil, Guyana, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, Mexico, Chile, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Mauritania, Morocco, Uruguay, Philippines, Pakistan are investing in healthy renewable projects. Last year, Bangladesh spent more than the UK 
on re renewable projects. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. <laughs> sea, <laughs> sea ice in the Arctic is disappearing at a terrifying rate. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. Eight times a hundred year superstorms have occurred in the US in the last 15 months. Eight, eight hundred year storms have appeared in the US alone in the last 15 months. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. Louisiana is experiencing a thousand year flood when I don't even know how much water fell in two days. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. 40% sure. of the plankton is dead in an acidifying ocean. And 40% of the Great Barrier Reef is bleached. In other words, dead forever. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. Sure. NASA tells us that every month for the last 14 months has broken world records in temperatures. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. Sure. June was the hottest month in recorded record. And Kinder Morgan wants to build a pipeline. Shame. I think that my idea is a whole lot better. <laughs> if this was a cruise ship and the hold was burning, would we be discussing whether Kinder Morgan could give us a bitumen pipeline to pour on the fire? Because that's essentially what we are doing. Our ship is on fire. Are we gonna pour more oil and bitumen onto the fire and make it even hotter? Who in their right mind would even propose such a thing? I would like to remind us, and I'm sure you've had this, this quote thrown at you many times in the last weeks. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used to create them. This pipeline is 19th century thinking, and we are trying very desperately to move into the next century. It really makes me wonder, what kind of a company persists with a project so obviously against the interests of the planet and the people of this province? What kind of a premier would risk the 98,000 sustainable jobs in BC that rely on a pristine coast for a project that will only create 50 toxic jobs? <laughs> what kind of an energy board trusts the word of a company with a history of four major spills and 1,848 safety violations. What kind of a provincial government would risk the 9.7 million GDP generated by our coastline for just one, that just one spill would ruin? What kind of government would risk a fire like this one? Could you pass me that, the picture? Thank you. It's it's, it's yeah. like this one that occurred in, Mos in Moscow with a, with, that set the river alight and happened only this week. The entire river was on fire. What kind, what kind of parents would we be if we let a few exceedingly wealthy people destroy our world, and ruin our children and grandchildren's future. Are we those kinds of people? No. What kind of leader would Justin Trudeau be if he betrayed his promises to First Nations, went back on his election promises to us, and said yes to such a project? At a recent concert, the dying leader of the tragically hip, Gord Downey, said to our Prime Minister, who was in the audience, we're in good hands, folks, real good hands. He cares about the people way up north that we were trained our entire lives to ignore. Train, 
trained our entire lives to hear not a word of what's going on up there. And what's going on up there ain't good. It's maybe worse than ever be, it's ever been, but we're going to get it fixed and we've got the right guy to do it, to start to help. Gord Downey was one of the first signatories of the LEAP Manifesto. He was at, he, he was at Cloquat Sound and he has protested against pipelines. What kind of prime minister would Justin Trudeau be if he betrayed Gord Downey's faith in him? Would we want to keep such a prime minister? I know I would not. So members of the panel, instead of saying to this project that you are prepared to go ahead, I would ask you with all the fierce love in my heart for this place and the people that I have come to love so dearly and many of whom are in this room, please take this, this message to the prime minister. We ask you to end our addiction to fossil fuel by mass mobilizing in a, in a way similar to World War II and helping us to move away from fossil fuels. End all projects that, fossil fuels, that are fossil fuel related, related and channel the funds into renewable energy. Ensure that we are 100% renewable by 2030. End all assistance to fossil fuel industries, including subsidies, and put all the money towards transforming our society to a renewable, sustainable economy. Make Canadians proud by becoming a real leader in the world and fighting climate change and, like, like Germany, Portugal, and China. Put in place environmental member measures to protect the environment, the animals, and the people of Canada from the greed of corporations whose only motive is profit. Follow every principle in the LEAP Manifesto and do so as quickly as is humanly possible. If instead you, re you recommend that this project goes ahead in the face of all reason and against our wishes, please know that I will oppose you with every last breath in my body. I will sell my home. I will give up my job. I will lie down in front of bulldozers. I will do whatever it takes to stop this project and any other like it from destroying my home and destroying my children's future. And I would ask those members of the audience who feel the same way I do to please stand. Thank you very much.